the Hubble Space Telescope, after over a decade of development, was finally launched on Tuesday, April 24, 1990, with the Space Shuttle crew of STS-31. The next several days would include a lot of long, stressful hours for the Hubble operations team and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Problems kept popping up, with the pressure of the entire world watching. But, even under pressure, engineers are capable of some pretty creative problem solving. Yeah, on a Friday morning at about 4.30, um, we noticed that we were getting what we call safe mode counts. There were uh, high torques developing in the high gain antenna that we, we didn't expect. The, uh, the high gain antennas are uh, the, our main way to communicate with the ground, to get our science data there. And we have two high gain antennas, one on each side. The spacecraft had noticed that when it tried to move one of the antennas, there was resistance and it, the spacecraft was programmed such that if it felt continued resistance, it would just declare sort of, uh, I'm not gonna go any further with this. On Saturday, we had gotten a Tiger team together and looked at the, uh, the high torques we'd seen on the high gain antenna on Friday. About two o'clock, we turned it back on again, tried to move it again, and immediately we saw we were still getting high torques on there. When I walked into the building on Sunday, after uh, having gotten a little bit of sleep, operations of the Hubble had basically stopped. The managers put all of the technical people in a room and said, figure this out. Today, you would bring it up on a screen and you would move the, the thing around and you would see what's going on. But these were much more primitive days. So I was in with my hands trying to figure out what the various positions of the, of the high gain antenna motors were. We were able to find some uh, loose leaf binder sort of things with a lot of photos of the high gain antenna. I saw this cable loop and it appeared to me to be at an odd position. Somewhere along the line I just, I, I said probably half jokingly, boy if I had a, a set of Tinker Toys I could, I could build a little model of this and, and show you guys what's, what's going on. You're sitting in a room with the highest power people in the business and you're proposing to go get a child's toy to help solve the problem. Dave Skillman uh, pulled me aside. He looked me straight in the face and he said, were you serious about that? I just kind of let myself out of the room and um, drove to the uh, nearby Toys R Us. People are asking me, can I help you? And I'm going, not easily, you know, this is not really the spacecraft aisle. And about an hour later, he came back and I sat down uh, at the table, he sat down next to me, and I put together a little working model of the, of the high cane antenna. And then right away, when I moved the, the two gimbals to the positions that they had been at when the torque occurred, uh, sure enough, this, this, uh, this little tinker toy model of a, of a counterweight was right in contact with this electrical extension cord. It was amazing how it actually allowed us to visualize what's going on out there in space. This area of high torque was really a relatively small piece of the total operational area of the high gain. As long as we stayed away from that obstruction, there was a whole you know, huge range of motion of the, of the antenna that would be able to operate. The, the model was able to convince the politicians and the managers that we did understand the problem. And then the technical guys had figured out what we needed to do to fix the problem. Nine o'clock that night, Sunday night, we. Uh, went into the control room and uh, the uh, folks in command uh, sent the commands up. And immediately we saw those torque levels go down when we turned it on and started to back, back it away. And we all breathed a big sigh of relief there saying, okay, we didn't break it. We think it's still operational. If we hadn't had use of the high, high gain, that would have been a, a big impact to Hubble. One of the Hubble Space Telescope's most memorable moments was observing the fragments of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact Jupiter in July 1994. This was a huge astronomical event that captured the attention of the public across the globe. But what most people don't know is that Hubble came close to not getting those observations. The telescope encountered some problems that might normally take over a month to solve just days before the comet impact. Shoemaker Levy 9 is a comet that was discovered uh, by David Levy, Carolyn Shoemaker, and Gene Shoemaker. We had about nine months of warning that this comet was going to hit Jupiter. I knew from the calculations we had done beforehand that if Hubble was working at the peak of its game, that we would get images that far surpassed images that could be taken with any other telescope on the Earth. 
So, so we knew the, the comet uh, Shoemaker-Levy was going to impact Jupiter on July 16th. Um, so we wanted to make sure Hubble was ready for that. July 5th, 1994 started out as an ordinary day until we were called and told that the Hubble had been commanded into inertial hold safe mode because it appeared that it was misbehaving and not executing the proper commands. When they command inertial hold, all those commands that were loaded uh, stop executing. We tell it to don't look at those anymore and just hold steady. You know, your first response is sort of an empty feeling in the pit of your stomach, like, oh no. <laughs> we have this huge event coming up and the telescope's not working. We had about a week to resolve the vehicle issue and bring it back to, to normal mode. The spacecraft was not executing the commands in the stored command sequence that it was supposed to be. It looked like it was doing something completely random. So we immediately suspected that there was a memory unit problem. We were lucky because the previous mission we had, we had done, we installed a coprocessor. During the first servicing mission in December of 93, the coprocessor was basically a memory uh, upgrade, uh, uh, an additional memory uh, to augment the, the DF-224 flight computer. Now this coprocessor <clears throat> has um, what do we call a shared memory uh, that both computers can use. Uh, so the shared memory uh, wasn't really configured yet to, to be usable, uh, but we knew it was there. We verified different configurations and different uh, architectures that we could test out, and we found that it was no issue to, to uh, swap out the memory. So we started doing that, and things were going extremely well. And suddenly, while we're in the middle of reconfiguring it, we were told that the spacecraft had entered zero gyro sun point, which is a more serious version of safe mode. What it looked like is that we had just lost two gyros simultaneously, which that can't happen. I remember just going, what's going on? You know, I didn't know what was happening. Here we are halfway through the reconfiguration and we're in deeper trouble than, than we had thought. I started looking at the, um, the time between the two events. Start figuring out, well, okay, it's two and a half days. What is that in hours, minutes, and seconds? I, I saw the number, it was, and it was, you know, it was really obvious at that point what happened. There was an overflow in, in the computer. Once we discovered that and knew there was an overflow in the software, we knew we didn't have a computer problem. It was easy, and then it was just, now we just have to recover. So by the time we finished that and got back up into the science operating mode, it was probably you know, middle, at the end of July 9th, so in plenty of time before the observations. Well, as soon as we heard that Hubble was back on track, we were like, yes, ready to go. It allowed the Shoemaker-Levy campaign to go forward, and uh, I'd hate to think what would have happened if we hadn't got the coprocessor in and got it checked out. We retreated to our offices and waited for the impact, wanted to see the pictures just like everybody else did, so we were watching it on NASA TV just like the rest of the world was. And I remember seeing the, uh, the press conference at the Science Institute announcing it and they were waiting for the pictures when Heidi Hamill came in waving the picture, the first picture from, from Hubble. That it probably indicates we're dealing with larger objects than was, re well, than was concluded by Ashfog and Benz. And I think we may have some up-to-date information yes. from IDM. <laughs> Eugene Shoemaker said he would be personally astonished if we saw nothing. Well, he's not going to be astonished. We actually saw some amazing things. The comet delivered. I mean, it delivered big time. Uh, it had big black spots, and, and if you looked at certain colors of light, it had white spots, and it had the rings, and it had plumes, and it had big giant storms. And I was really proud to be a part of that, and I was really proud that all the engineers and scientists could pull together and make that happen. NASA Goddard Space Telescope Operations Control Center has seen a lot of activity over the past 25 years of the Hubble Space Telescope. It looks calm now, but 13 years ago, it was a very different story. Engineers at the Goddard Space Flight Center discovered that there was a very small fault in the power control unit. You know, it's the heart of Hubble. It, um, all the power runs through that box. To change out the PCU, you actually have to turn off the telescope. And this is something we've never, ever done, is turn the telescope completely off. Because when you turn all of the power off of Hubble, it starts getting cold. 
you know, space is a cruel environment, and so the temperature control of the telescope is very important. I was brought on to develop a command procedure, which we called the Super Proc, which would turn the telescope off as quickly as we possibly could. For months, we analyzed different scenarios. We thought through everything that could possibly go wrong. You know, we felt confident we had a, a, a ream of analysis. I arrived late at night for the start of the orbit shift. So the team was very prepared and very focused on, on what we had to do that night. You know, everything was pretty calm. Everything was, you know, you're nervous, but everything was going according to plan. John is getting into the suit. He's getting into the airlock. They're going through all their checklists, and we're sending commands and commands. It's like a ro we're starting down a roller coaster ride. The goal was always to have the work site ready to go with whatever power needed to be removed for safety considerations just when the crew got to the work site. All of a sudden, we hear over the loops, we hear John say, I have a leak. What does that mean? A water leak in a suit, you know, that's, that's not good. Then Al comes on the loops and tells us, stop doing the commanding. We need to figure out what we're gonna do from this point. What we immediately did was started to assess what components we had already powered off. Then I said, you know, these things don't have a lot of margin. You know, we, we're, we're up to the line. Our, our thermal engineers would tell us, well, we, given the condition and the te current temperatures, we've got a certain amount of time. I said, okay, turn on this. Turn on this instrument. Turn on these, you know, general bus heaters. At the same time, the astronauts are frantically working to change out John's suit to get him back ready. The next thing we hear is, okay, we've got it fixed. You know, he got into a different suit and things, you know, were working well. We turned right back around and started shutting things back off. And so we were, we were right back on that roller coaster of powering down again. It was a relief to me. We're back on track. You know, we're back to, you know, the original plan. Luckily, we had everything reconfigured in time. So by the time, by the time John got to the door and was ready to start working on the PCU, we were able to send the super proc. The telescope is powered down. The telescope was completely off. It's an engineer's lifeblood to sit there and watch the telemetry, to watch the temperatures, watch the voltages, watch the power, make sure everything is safe while they're working on the telescope, but we had none of that. All we could do was sit back and watch John perform what was you know, the most amazing EVA of all times. It was like watching poetry in motion. Before we knew it, it was time to power things back on. Uh, they give us the call down to say, go for the PCU aliveness test. This is where we actually can send the commands to turn the telescope back on. All of a sudden, this flood of telemetry starts coming in from the telescope. Power was running through it, the batteries were charging, um, and for me, the temperatures <laughs> were, were looking in a safe you know, range. Everyone's looking at their screens, and and it was pretty much just green across the board. Hubble Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, or STIS, has capabilities like searching for black holes and looking at the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars. After STIS had a power failure in 2004, the Hubble team was tasked with replacing STIS's damaged electronics boards on the final servicing mission in 2009, which would turn out to be a memorable day for everyone involved. So for about two years, I spent almost every day with the EVA team, four crew members. We practiced that repair many, many times, and we had practiced it in the water start to finish in the pool many times. We spent hours and days and weeks and months going through what if this bolt fails? Uh, what if the cable doesn't mate? So I felt that we had covered you know, as much as we could have thought of going into this, this EVA. So we came in to work here at the Space Telescope Operations Control Center at Goddard. Our mechanical response team was, was watching the EVA in a conference room in Building 29. I was located down at Johnson Space Center along with the servicing mission manager. The day started out really well. You know, I was, I was trying to make it a perfect day, no problems. So they get to the section where they have to remove the handrail on STIS. And you have to remove this handrail that was designed actually to help remove and install the entire instrument. Um, in order to access the electronics board underneath. And we watched Mike Massimino attempt to do a rather simple task 
all you had to do was remove four screws from a handrail. And so the two screws at the top of the handrail came off fine. The one on the bottom left comes out fine. I go to the bottom right. We could see the pistol grip tool spinning in the bolt head, and the bolt wasn't coming out. I don't want to strip the thing. Oh my god. Um, that was the first thing, you know, it's what are we going to do because this is a, a showstopper right here. For a while, probably about an hour or so, we were trying different bits on the end of the power tool. You know, we were trying all kinds of things. You know, and one thing that crossed my mind was, what would you do? What would you do at home? You know, what would you do in your garage? You know, and I was thinking back to my garage, you know, and sometimes what would I do, you know, and I just kind of, you know, use the brute force, you know, so I thought, you know, what about just trying to break it? You know? It didn't even occur to a lot of us, just because it's something that you're not really ever trained to do or think of. So one of the things I did was I called back to James Cooper back here at Goddard. James Cooper called us on the speakerphone and said, hey guys, what are you, you're watching this, right? And we said, yeah, yeah, of course. We found out we did have a mock-up of this, this front panel with the handrail on it. We came up with a quick plan. Bill Mitchell said, I, I've got two handrails inside the clean room. And Ken Dickinson and I came up with a plan for how to rig up the test. So we scattered into the building to get all the materials we were going to need. Well, it was a Sunday. Nobody was around. So I, I'm, you know, I'm literally running through the halls, and I, I run to where the techs would be, and I find a guy, Gene McCallicker, who happened to be in the building working on another project. So he said, what do you need? He, he seemed to pick up on my body language before I even asked my question. I told him, I need a, a torque wrench, and uh, I need a, a, a digital fish scale. He takes off to go get it. I go to 190. Ken Dickinson's already in there, and within minutes, Bill Mitchell comes busting through the door, carrying the handrail, still in his bunny suit and his clean room garment. We get the handrail all set up, everything's ready to go. We text a couple pictures back and forth. James gives us the green light, and Gene stands up on the table and starts pulling the handrail. And right when he got to 60 pounds, it snapped. The, actually, the bolt went flying. Once we'd done that test, then I got on our communication loops and called it to uh, Jim Corbo. So ultimately, you know, James came back and said, you know, it'll take about 60 pounds of force for them to break it off. So Goddard had done this task, fed the information to us. We talked to the flight director about it to get him comfortable. Okay, Mass, you copy that. 60 yep. pounds linear at the top of the handrail to bust off that bottom bowl. I, I think you've got that in you. Perfect, Troy. I knew I could do that. What if he pulls it off and there's debris? What if he pulls off the handrail and there's a sharp edge? What if he, it takes a lot of force and it comes back and hits him? Mike Massimino was able to put some tape over the head of the bolt to contain debris that, that might go flying. And so I taped it as best I could, and Boyner was with me, helping me to tape that thing. And then... Spanish Houston, we don't have video right now, but uh, we're ready. Okay, Mass, you have a go. Here we go. So, disposal back, please. Everyone erupted in cheers. Uh, because when he pulled it off, he didn't see any debris, um, and he knew not to touch the, the potential sharp edges, and then we could just put that fastener capture plate on and complete the STIS task. The rest of the repair went fairly well. STIS, I mean, it was fine, actually, and, uh, and STIS is working. That one or two hours that I worked on breaking the handrail, that task, that very well could go down as a highlight of my career. So the, the Goddard team did a, did a great job, and, and I'm forever in their debt.